morning. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker this morning, um, our very own Dr. Amy Hughes. One of the things you may not realize as students here is just the wealth and the depth and the um, just the value of the faculty that are available to you. She is um, a historic theologian of early Christianity. I actually read work in seminary that cited her extensively. And I was like, I know someone famous and it's you. Um, she's so smart and wonderful, but also a really great people person. She loves Star Wars and knows a lot more about that than I do. But she just has such a depth and richness to what she offers us here on campus. And one of the things I value so much about her work in early Christianity is how it actually affects and shapes the conversations that we're having today. So please join me in giving Dr. Amy Hughes a warm welcome. Hi, Gordon. Aw. Thank you all for being here today. Aw. Good to see you. Philippians 2, 1 through 11. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you not look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So this passage is one of the most important passages in the New Testament about the Incarnation. And today we're going to focus on two sections that will help us understand who Christ is and what Christ came to do. Christ as slave. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. The second person of the Trinity did not consider equality with God, his status and power as God is something to be exploited, used for his own gain. God's power is displayed in relinquishing that status and power to become not sort of like us, but just like us. God becomes human, a human who lived in a particular time and place without antibiotics or toilets or social media. A Jew, a tradesman who lived in a backwater town called Nazareth under a brutal empire. An empire that was at best suspicious of people like him and was always ready to respond with extreme violence. Philippians 2.7 says that God in Christ took the form of a doulos. A slave. This word is sometimes translated as servant. Maybe the Bibles that you're using this morning, that's the word that's used. It's the word for slave. In the Roman Empire, slaves were not human. They were things to be used. Dulos indicates total subservience, a person owned by another. A dulos is not in control of the system they are in. A dulos is deemed worthless, Inherit, having no inherent value and without meaningful contribution unless a master gives it to them. A doulos is deemed unseemly, ugly, not fit for society, and not memorable. They're not even counted. A doulos is deemed as deserving of contempt, especially if they step out of line. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, became a doulos, the worthless, unseemly, and despised. 
And scripture emphasizes this point elsewhere, most directly in the Christian reading of Isaiah 53. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing it is in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering, acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. So Philippians 2, 1 through 11 is one of the most studied sections in Paul's letters. So there are different reads of this passage that try to unpack what it means for God of the universe to take on the form of a slave. So today I'm going to take a particular theological read of this passage that we find in early Christian texts through the fourth century, especially in martyrdom texts, and one martyrdom text in particular. So, around 177 CE, a group of Christians were targeted by a mob in the cities of Lyon and Vienne in Gaul. And you're like, where's Gaul? Well, it's modern day France. And they were brought before the Roman governor on a variety of very salacious and made-up charges. And the letter from Lyon and Vienne tells us the story of these Christians, most of whom were executed as martyrs. This group of 48 Christians had little in common with one another besides their faith. Some were Roman citizens, some were not. Some were of high status and others of lowest. Men, women, young, old, enslaved, and free. So today I want to introduce you to one of those martyrs. Her name was Blandina. Blandina was a young enslaved woman. And that combination of enslaved, young, and woman places Blandina at the very bottom of society. So low that she was not counted as human. We know from other clues in the text that she was probably around your age, between 18 and 22. She is rounded up with the other Christians and they are taken to prison, tortured, and eventually killed. When confronted by the Roman authorities and torturers, Blandina confesses, I am Christian and we do nothing wrong. The Roman powers that be threw all they had at Blandina, and yet she remains constant in this confession. Her torturers marvel at the sight of her body broken and torn open and testified that she should have been dead long before. The Roman torturers throw up their hands and give up. Like, the Romans are pretty good at this, so for them to do that, that's quite something. They do not even have what it takes to break this young woman, who societally they don't even deem as a person. Blandina doesn't just outlast her torturers, she defeats them. In the Roman Empire, an enslaved woman had no bodily or judicial integrity, no ability to demonstrate virtue, no position in society to offer or to receive advocacy, and no access to the rights and privileges of family. But in this letter, Blandina gains status she's not granted, a family she was not allowed to have, and she experiences exodus a reference to the deliverance of God from enslavement. Last of all, the blessed Blandina, like a well-born mother, something she was not allowed to be, who has urged her children and sent them victorious to the king, and who has also herself suffered through each of her children's contests, was eager to join them, rejoicing and celebrating in her exodus, as though being called to a marriage feast and not being thrown to the beasts. Blandina's martyrdom is understood as emancipation, God's judgment upon and deliverance from her enslavers. This ancient letter spends a lot of time with Blandina. We hear a lot about what the Romans did to her, and it's awful. The Romans were very creative and brutal in their methods of torture. But the author of this letter doesn't focus on that material as much as you might think. Most of the early Christian martyr stories don't belabor the suffering more than they had to just as the Gospels don't spend a lot of time describing Jesus' torture and crucifixion. And there are two main reasons for this. First, they were surrounded by this kind of death all the time, and no one needed to go into detail. And second, because torture and even death isn't the point of these works. Jesus Christ's story is about redemption unto victory for us, and Blandina's story is about one of us experiencing and testifying to that victory. It is Blandina, this young enslaved woman, 
through whom Christ demonstrated that what appears worth, worthless, unseemly, and contemptible or despised to humans is deemed worthy of great glory by God on account of the God-directed love which is revealed by real power and not boasted of in appearance. So the stories of early Christian martyrs are about God in Christ as that person. That the one who is suffering, who is a target, who is the lowest, and that person experiencing cosmic and systemic justice in Christ. Christ took the form of a slave. God became worthless, unseemly, and despised. Blandina, for her part, was hung on a piece of wood and offered as food for the beasts that were set upon her. And as she hung there, she was seen in the form of a cross and through her strenuous prayer provided the competitors with great encouragement. For in her contest, they saw with her, their external eyes, their sister, the one who had been crucified on their behalf so that she might persuade those who believe in him that everyone who suffers for the glory of Christ will always have communion with the living God. This small, weak, and despised woman had put on Christ, the unconquerable athlete, prevailing over the adversary through many rounds by her struggle, being wreathed with the crown of immortality. So instead of trembling in this arena while hanging from a post, Blandina prays, and others see her in the form of a cross. Those who saw her through their eyes saw Blandina as Christ. Blandina enters that arena to be devoured, but instead she endures against the evil powers that be. Christ, as an enslaved young woman, validates Blandina's person, but also embodies judgment as her to judge those who enslave and those who brutalize. Because the martyr shares in Christ's death. They access the glory of Christ's victory over death in death. The letter doesn't emphasize an enslaved young woman's glorious and good pain for Jesus. Instead, it shows the way of Christ is deliverance from pain and justice for the pain experienced in the arena as well as for a lifetime of painful experiences. God in Christ's suffering is the mechanism for the suffering person or community to experience the defeat of the power of Satan, healing of pain, deliverance from suffering, and the justice of God. Martyrdom texts do not seek to redeem pain. Blandina's story does not communicate redemptive pain, but Christ's redemption of pain for Blandina's emancipation. The author of the letter is not interested in communicating martyrdom as an unmitigated terror to be endured before one experiences reward, a kind of divine hazing, as it were. Instead, the glory of reward, healing, and communion with God and with one another invades the arena. Christ voluntarily invaded death's space and brought life in the form of his very presence and then resurrection. Thus, those who share in Christ's death do not experience death without the promise and presence of resurrection life right there, too. Theologian John Baer writes, In this way, freedom, rather than necessity, becomes the basis for a truly human experience in Christ. This is a new existence, beginning with the act of freedom, that of Christ voluntarily going to his passion, converting the use of death for all, and in this way, enabling us also to start over freely by following him. Blandina suffers as Christ, but as the glorified Christ. Very important. In other words, the author of the letter communicates that her sharing in Christ's suffering the bone-breaking, tendon-tearing, disfiguring, disabling torture and execution on a cross makes an actual experiential difference for her in that moment. In her book, The Disabled God Toward a Liberatory Theology of Disability, Nancy Eastland writes this. In the resurrection, Jesus Christ's body is not only his transfigured form that still embodies the reality of impaired hands, feet, and side. It also consists of the body whose life and unity come from the Holy Spirit active in our continuing history. In, us, in summoning us to remembrance of his body and blood at the table, the disabled God calls us to liberating relationships with God 
our bodies and others. Blandina, as Christ, experiences in the suffering what Christ has won through suffering. Blandina experiences the present circumstance, but by virtue of her sharing in Christ's sufferings, she also experiences some of that glorious resurrection to come. Christ as politic. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Philippi was a Roman colony that was full of retired soldiers and known for its patriotic imperial nationalism. Naturally, Paul got into some trouble there for proclaiming Jesus as Lord instead of Caesar as Lord. Spicy, Paul. So spicy. So Paul sends a letter to this vibrant community of Philippi who knew what it was like to be imprisoned and to suffer and to live under the threat of execution. And Paul is encouraged by their faithfulness and sees Christ at work in them and among them. And Philippians is full of warmth and love and community during persecution, imprisonment, and suffering. In the face of the Roman powers that be, what kind of power does this little community of Christians in Philippi have? Practically speaking, their little community amounted to rickety shacks overshadowed by the vastness of a Colosseum. However, the early church is full of little communities like Philippi and those like Blandina and other martyrs who resist tyranny with their demonstration of virtue in the face of brutality, the brutality of a Roman Empire. The martyrs are judged and found faithful, but the martyrs also judge. They judge those powers of evil. The letter from Lyon and Vienne assumes that the Roman powers that be are judged and will be judged for how Blandina is treated. Christ as Blandina in this text means that Christ attends to the specific concerns and context of an enslaved young woman. Thus, for Christ, it is necessary to pass judgment on the Romans for treating her as a thing and not a person. While enslavement is not denounced in the letter specifically, an enslaved young woman experiencing exodus is not a neutral stance. The letter portrays Blandina, the worthless, unseemly, and despised one, to be the judge of her slaveholder mistress, the Roman powers that be, and the evil cosmic powers that be. Blandina as Christ and Christ as Blandina judges based on a new politic, the kingdom of God that is here and is coming. The implication is that Blandina's emancipation is God's will, and he wants it done. Stories like that of Blandina contend that in Christ, the unsuitable become suitable. The worthless, unseemly, and despised are revealed as worthy, honor, and and priceless. And these that are the last will be first in God's kingdom. Every Christian's life is marked by the death of the old self and the birth of the new one with citizenship in God's kingdom. We must act accordingly. The early Christians pass stories like Blandina around because seeing and experiencing Christ changes everything. God's glory in enslaved young woman has ramifications for how one is to treat enslaved young women. Blandina wasn't noble because she suffered. The letter indicates that her nobility is present before she suffers. What society has already taken from her was an injustice, and here Christ is identified with those like her. Instead, he comes for someone like her and others like her who are forced low in society. Theologian and pastor with autism, Lamar Hardwick, says this, Our struggle with disability is rooted in the adversarial relationship with the bodies that God has deemed worthy of becoming his temple. Disabled bodies are no less worthy of this honor. Jesus affirms them as his dwelling place. Disabled bodies may be different with different challenges and different limitations, but in the end... It is our perspective about the world, about our bodies, and more specifically, disabled bodies, that is abnormal. To see the brutalized, disabled, cruciform, and victorious Blandina is to see Christ. And when early Christians answer the question posed to Peter by Jesus Christ, who do you say that I am? The author of this letter presumes that one answer would be Blandina. When we answer Jesus' question, when it's posed to us, what will our answer be? Who do you say that I am? Who is Christ among us now? Where is Christ among us now? The deemed worthless, unseemly, and despised that we cannot see or refuse to see.
So this is where my preparation for the sermon today, the Holy Spirit stopped me. Breaking of the sermon fourth wall. Because this is the point in the sermon where the application comes in. This is where I might start to give examples of those who are deemed worthless and seemly and despised that we overlook and even harm further by our neglect and our stereotypes. I might even challenge us to pray and ask God to show us who those people are and to give us eyes to see. We'd pray and then we'd sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, because I do love a good preacher worship music combo. Except the Holy Spirit said no. A real definitive no, like two days ago. (laughs) So that's fine. You know, this is a fine end to the sermon, but that's not the end for Gordon College Chapel this morning. Okay, Holy Spirit, got it. So let's rewind the tape. Do y'all even know that reference? I'm so old. (laughs) When early Christians answered the question posed to Peter by Jesus Christ, who do you say that I am? The author of this letter presumes that one answer would be Blandina. When we answer Jesus' question, when it's posed to us, who do you say that I am? Who is Christ among us now? Where is Christ among us, the deemed worthless, unseemly, and despised that we cannot or refuse to see? Christ is here, right now, through the Holy Spirit. But maybe for whatever reason, he is really hard for you to see. Maybe you don't want to see Christ, or you feel like you don't You can't or you shouldn't because you feel worthless, unseemly, and despised. You are not worthless. Your voice, your body, your presence, your contributions are of value. That thing that person said to you that tore into your confidence, that vibe of what are you doing here when you walk into that room, That date that made you feel like no one would ever want you, like you want to be wanted. That idea that you had that was shot down. You are not worthless. You are not unseemly. You fit. You belong. You are not too loud or too weird or too awkward or too slow or too quiet or too broken or too much. You will miss a social cue. You will try and fail to understand an expectation. You will try to impress and only be embarrassed. Something physical about you might stand out and has been caused for ridicule because you don't fit. Sometimes your brain wants you to be in bed and sad, and you will wonder how others seem to function when you can't. Sometimes you perseverate, running situations over and over and over, and you can't let a past conversation rest, and you can't seem to get the rehearsal of a future conversation right. But you are not unseemly. You are not despised. You are not worthy of contempt. Your gender, your race, your disability, your sexuality, your socioeconomic status, your whatever. You are not to be despised. But what if you've done terrible things? Perhaps you think you are worth being despised for what you've done or failed to do. You think you are unlovable. You avoid, you hide, but you are not worthy of contempt. But you hear it and you believe it. That you are worthless, unseemly, and despised. Y'all, those are lies from the pit of hell. Those lies are the playbook of the enemy. It's the oldest and most effective trick he's got. To tell us that you are not enough and that also you're too much at the same time. You are created in the image of God. And God himself showed up and took on the form of the lowest of the low. Because whatever other humans and the devil can say about us, it is not the fundamental truth of you. God took the form of a slave because a human being, a slave, is a lie from the pit of hell that needs to be trampled under his heel. In taking the form of a slave, God grabbed every lie about humans that the enemy can throw at us about our inherent worth and yanked him up on that cross with him. But oh, he wasn't done. He took one look at that shame that eats our souls and he scorned it. And during Holy Saturday, he pursued those lies all the way into death itself to lead an exodus, setting those captives free and every captive to shame and lies since. And on that cross, God died. And in dying, he took that shame, those lies and death itself and robbed them of victory. God is always there in the deepest dark because God has been there and refuses to let the shame and lies flourish. He shows up in the dark, the lowest places, the places where we think God has no business, and he plants himself, life right in the middle of death. 
So that not only is Blandina, a young, enslaved, abused, weak, exploited woman included in God's kingdom, but she is witness to redemption, freedom, and justice, and there are so many Blandinas, so many people who suffer in silence, who are lost in the dark, who the world takes no notice of, who are not named, who are deemed worthless. So many stories, and Christ is with everyone. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but here's the deal. God's glory came for us and comes for us still. In the darkest place, God's glory lights up the darkness, looks you straight in the face and says, look at me, I'm here. Y'all could go deep in that darkness, but there is no pit where God cannot find you. And then perhaps God follows it up with, and you found love in a hopeless place. Because sometimes God quotes Rihanna, Hear the good news, my friends. For God so loved the world, so loved you, that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You are why he came. You are so loved. You are the joy set before him. You are why he endured the cross and took on shame. You are also why he will come again. You are why he will make all things right. You are worthy of God's very life. You are God's great joy. You are God's great love. Amen. You are dismissed.